concept for EPAR trade is basically, in my opinion, there's a big hole in the internet. So the internet started many years ago, but there's never been an online business community for racers on the World Wide Web. The need for EPAR trade is actually quite obvious. Basically, people in the business of auto racing need a place online to hang out and get their problems solved. It's extremely simple for a buyer or for a supplier to interact on the platform. The first thing you need to do is sign in, which is free. And the second thing is when you see a product that you're interested in, all you need to do is click on request more information. If it's a company, you click on request more information. And then from there, it is forwarded directly to the buyer or to the supplier. You can go to epartrade.com, you become part of a community of businesses in racing and it makes uh, sourcing products much easier than just on the internet or using Google. At epartrade there is no e-commerce, it's literally a connection just like at a trade show. So now, any time of the year, a buyer could reach out to a supplier through an email. More than that, it's a place to go just to keep current every day. So it's a good place to start your work day in your racing business or in your offices of your professional race team. And you know you're current when it comes to new technology, industry news, technical papers, technical videos, all of that and more. We're not looking for a million hits per day. All we want is people who are really the volume buyers of racing products in the racing industry to be part of the little world of EPAR trade. We have racing businesses participating from around the world. So you get suppliers from around the world, you get buyers from around the world. EPAR trade really eliminates having to travel, closing down your shop. Now you have a place to showcase globally your racing product and technology. Good morning from California. It is nine o'clock here. Welcome to Race Industry Now, the technical and business webinar series from EPAR Trade presented by ARP. I am Francisque Savignan, the founder and CEO of EPAR Trade. With me this morning is Judy King, the co founder of EPAR Trade, and Brad Giddy, our wonderful host. How are you guys doing today? Good. Excellent. Excellent. Right. You know, Francisque, I'm really excited because we are now officially confirmed all the way through October, confirmed with some great companies coming on with technical webinars. We've got Rottler coming on with Lake Speed. We've got Molly Motorsports, Talking Pistons, Dragonfire Performance. So um, just some great brands, some new ones for everybody to enjoy. Ab absolutely, absolutely. So Brad, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, this is good. Uh, something I love, shocks and suspensions, and we're going to do it. Uh, the title, the 10 most common shock and suspension issues and how to resolve them by Penske Shocks. And uh, it's so wonderful to do these webinars week in and week out and talk about different parts of a race car and different things that can really help the racers. And not only that, help the brands who are on the platform of EPAR Trade talk directly to the consumers and their customers. Uh, absolutely. And we're delighted to bring uh, Aaron and Jim from Penske uh, Shocks for the second time. They participated uh, uh, last December in Online Race Industry Week. I've known uh, Jim for decades. <laughs> and uh, uh, both those guys are brilliant at what they do. They are at the top of their games. And I'm delighted to have them back on a webinar today. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you guys doing? Good morning, Francisco. Good, good morning. How are you How guys? Are you? Good. Excellent. So enough said from us. Brad Gilly, you're in charge and you have the full hour. We'll see you in about uh, 59 minutes or so. All right. Thank you very much, Francisco. Really appreciate that. And welcome to today's Race Industry Now webinar. We appreciate you being a part of this. Um, we're going to talk about shocks. We're going to talk about suspension. And uh, hopefully we can actually help educate you and uh, maybe even bring up some questions that you have here over the next hour. As always, if you have questions, feel free to bring them up in the chat. There's a lot of topics that we're going to cover here today, and we'll certainly try and get to your questions as well while also staying on topic. But again, as we mentioned, today's title, the 10 most common shock and suspension issues and how to resolve them by Penske Shocks. And joining us today, Adam Lambert, the general manager, and uh, Jim Arenza, technical director of Penske Shocks. And gentlemen, really happy you're here today. Uh, happy that you guys are back on and absolutely looking forward to everything that we're going to be talking about. How is everyone? Hey, we're doing well here. Uh, thanks for having us. It's always uh, great being able to reach out and talk to everybody out there. 
uh, eBar Trade gives us a great platform to be able to do that. So uh, it, it's been good. I mean, it's been a been a crazy busy season. I think most uh, uh, most people in the in the racing industry can attest to that. It's just been uh, trying to keep up with everything, produce as much as you can, hit as many races as you can. Um, so it's it's good to be able to do this, sit down, and hopefully uh, on on uh, at least Eastern time uh, on their lunch break, reach out, hopefully ask some questions, and get ready for the races this weekend. Well, we definitely know that, you know, uh, when it comes to shocks and suspensions, there's a lot of science involved and there's a lot of things involved that, um, you know, are, are very specific to certain types of race cars and specific to other types of race cars, especially in what you're wanting to do and what you want to accomplish. And I know you guys have some really great customer service and you talk to a lot of racers week in and week out about some of the issues that they're dealing with and how they can potentially solve their problems. So, you know, what are some of the most common things that you're asked about when people call in over there um i think i think some of the most common ones that our technicians deal with is is just really the feel of the suspension whether it be too hard too soft uh what what does a customer have to do to either adjust for that condition um and then it really comes down to the application i mean whether it's drag racing sports car motorcycle uh short track dirt cars asphalt whatever it is there's so many different uh, forms of racing that, that we have but typically it really comes down to uh, making the driver comfortable and that's really the end goal. Uh, there's so many new things out there, uh, whether it be a NASCAR, Formula One, IndyCar, using simulation and things like that. But in the end, it really comes down to the driver sitting behind the wheel and making them comfortable. Uh, so that's really, the, those are really the most, all the questions are related to, uh, crew chiefs might call and ask about tire wear and things like that. Uh, but in the end, uh, we always tell our, our customers and the, and the racers and the teams is number one is make that driver comfortable. If the driver's not comfortable, the rider's not comfortable, it's going to be really hard to go fast. Uh, but if you, can, if you can start to achieve that, and whether that be in compliancy, um, over bumps, curbing, things like that, there's so many variables. But if you can make that driver more comfortable, typically going to get a better lap time. So. And when we define comfort in this, or I mean, is it fair to say we're also talking about confidence, you know, confidence when, you know, their, their bike or their car settles into a corner that it's going to do exactly what they want it to do? Yeah, you're hundred percent correct there. It's really the, the confidence that, that the driver is going to have. Uh, as far as comfort, it's not so much being able to drive like a Cadillac and lay back and, and be comfortable that way, but really the confidence, like you're talking about, knowing that you can, you can drive into a corner deeper. Uh, you can brake later and the, the car, the, the motorcycle, whatever it might be, is going to stick and stay underneath you. Um, and, and that's really what we're, what we're trying to do. If you can do that better than, than the guy you're racing against, you're probably going to be in front of them. So. You know, if you walk around, um, you know, any paddock area, any garage area, uh, any pit area, what it might be. A lot of times when you hear racers talking to each other during practice sessions or other times, you do hear people talking about, hey, you know, what springs are you running or how are you doing this? But I don't necessarily know that you always hear people talking about shocks um, as much as you do something like that. So when it comes to spring rate and, and shock performance, how do the two interact? Um, they're, they're really hand in hand. Um, one complements the other. So the spring rate itself is initially there to support the weight of the vehicle. Um, there's other attributes that that spring is going to contribute to on the vehicle performance, but then the job of the shock is to really complement and control that spring rate. Uh, depending on the type of racing that you're, you're involved in, whether it be stock car, oval racing, road course racing, you're going to use a different spring rate to either get more compliance in the vehicle, um, to have a certain ride height to right now, uh, the big, the big, uh, thing is aero, uh, aerodynamics and, and making sure the car balance is very good aerodynamically. You can get more grip out of a car if it's, if the aero balance is better. So there's a bunch of different ways that, to set up a spring rate or choose the correct spring rate. But then obviously next to that, or, or going one step further is making sure your shock's performing to control that spring rate. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just one piece of the puzzle, uh, but it, it's a big piece of the puzzle for sure, having the two work together. You know, I mean, sort of getting off on a tangent of that a little bit is, you know, if I'm a racer, if I'm still fairly new to this, um, you know, let, or let's just say I've been kind of taking shocks for granted. I mean, I, I have an idea of what they do and I have an idea of what they want to do. 
if I call you guys and say, hey, this is what I'm doing, you know, what is it I need? You know, what 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 am I going to get when I call you guys as far as talking about some of those things and really how it relates to my application? That's that's a that's a great question. And one thing where we a new platform for us that we just started to promote is our S3 platform. And the S3 is simply stands for shot, setup, and support. Um, and that's really taking the customer from the start of understanding what the correct shot for their application is, um, how to set that up. And then the, probably the biggest thing that we, we are really proud about is our support. And whether that be at the racetrack or being able to call somebody and talk to somebody with experience on the phone, the support is really what it's all about. Um, there's a lot of manufacturers out there. Almost everybody has a rebuildable shot now, something that you can customize, tune to, to your to your application to what you need, but it's knowing knowing what you need and how to get there and get that final that, that final piece. So our setup, uh, our setup, but mostly our support is really big for us. Um, and I, I I tell all of our customers, um, a lot of people see the Penske name and the racing name and they're like, well, I got a street car, I can't even call and talk to them. But I tell everybody that's why we have technicians here. We have an office in North Carolina, we have one in Michigan, we have one in Pennsylvania. We have great dealers located all over the globe. Um, that's what we have them for, for our customers to be able to call and get firsthand knowledge and, and experience that they can help get you to the finish line quicker. Uh, there's so many variables out there. There's so much. It's, it's nearly impossible for one person to do it all. And uh, your amateur racer, your Saturday night racer, they're usually driving the truck, cleaning the car, working on it and they're, and they're the driver. So it's nearly impossible for them to know everything about the car. So that's why I tell everybody, all of our customers, don't ever hesitate to call us. Uh, well, that's what we're here for, so. And, and uh, I'll interject there real quick. I mean, it, it really depends. It, it's not um, concentrated on particular ranks of racing, um, you know, from Formula One down. I mean, we're also asked as a damper supplier to uh, with certain spring rates and torsion bar rates, what the damping rates uh, should be. And then we optimize the setup from there for say an Oklahoma one application. And then, and then as Aaron mentioned, all the way down to all the other ranks of racing, you know, it's, it's the same sort of concept that's optimizing that spring and damper package, no matter what it is. And, and that's what we're very good at doing. Um, and, and the S3 program definitely, um, you know, promotes that whole sort of philosophy. Yeah, no, I think that's great, especially if you're helping racers integrate, you know, what they're doing and, you know, maybe even finding new things that maybe they might not have discovered uh, in their setup. You know, getting into some shock terminology and everything, and we start to talk about, uh, you know, damping and all of that and, you know, making your shock too stiff or not stiff enough. You know, what are some things that that racers need to know about? Uh, so there, if, if we start, I always like to start with, I tell customers, you always want to start with the entry to a corner. Um, if you can't get into a corner, your mid and your exit is going to be very difficult. So I always break them down. We try to break them down into three segments. So entry is, is your number one thing. And very simple is just take your front end. If your front end is too stiff, you're probably going to have an understeer condition. Um, and an understeer is simply when you, when you go to turn that wheel, uh, the front end pushes. It doesn't go where you want it to go. It actually is outside the track of where you want it to go. Um, and, that, and that's an understeer. And typically that is when the suspension, it could be a combination of the spring, the bar, the shock setting, um, a combination of all three is just too stiff. Um, so when that happens, it, it's, again, that's why we have adjusters on, on the shocks themselves. Uh, you would go and soften up that suspension via either the shock adjustments or a softer spring rate, let that front end come down a little bit, and that'll allow you to turn in easier and get to the center. Um, and then again, once you get to the center, you have the same variables. So you could have uh, an understeer or a tight condition, or you can have an oversteer loose condition. Um, and then that would be your adjustments that you got to work on for the center of the corner. And then same thing coming off the corner on exit, on a corner exit, it's a little bit different because a lot of times you're applying the power. Um, when you get to the apex, that's when you're trying to get back to the power. So now you have a weight transfer that you have to contend with. So that's a combination of front rebound and rear compression. Um, and again, it's it's one, one area the shocks can help control, but it's always, like you said before, it's a combination of how the shocks controlling the spring and the weight transfer. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of variables there, but 
those are a simple way to break it down for a corner is entry, mid, and exit. And then uh, looking at front compression and rear rebound, and then vice versa as you're exiting the corner. And that's more for obviously road racing or oval track racing. Uh, but then we have drag racing as well. So drag racers are always big on, hey, we're not turning, we're just going straight. Uh, so drag racers are always looking at just that 60 foot, improving that 60 foot time, um, improving your mid track and then your your uh, your top end. So uh, drag racing is a little bit different. It's set up a little bit different. Um, and it also depends on if you're running a four link suspension or a standard uh, rear rear suspension. Um, there, there are always different types of adjustments there as well. But we're doing the same thing. You're just controlling compression and rebound, and you're really trying to control that spring rate and and how the uh, how the suspension is moving when you first apply that power. So, now how do I know or have an idea of when my issue is either spring related or just something I can fix with the shock? That's a great question, and that and that's um it, that really comes down to uh, I, I guess the understanding of whoever's working on the car. Um, you can do it both ways. There's really no wrong answer. And that's one, that's one thing we always try to let or try to teach our customers or anybody dealing with suspension. There is no one right answer. Um, there's a million different ways to skin a cat and suspension, shock settings, spring rates, bars. There are all variables that you can tune and get a similar result. In the end, what's better or worse really comes down to driver feel. Some drivers are more sensitive to a shock adjustment rather than a spring adjustment. Uh, some drivers like to put a bar, they feel a bar change better than they feel a shock adjustment. Um, so it really comes down to driver feel first, but then you go to the next step and say, okay, what, how does it affect tire wear? Each of those adjustments and what you do will affect your tire differently. So if you're doing an endurance race and you have a long stint and you need the tires to last longer, you might make a different adjustment to a shock rather than doing it to a spring. Uh, so again, it's it's one of the many changes in, in this huge combination of suspension pieces that you can adjust and you're gonna get a different, a different answer or a different outcome regardless of what you adjust. It's just trying to find the right one. And ultimately, the more you learn, the more you understand it, the more you test. Testing is just, it's huge because that's really the only the only way to get some live results is to go out there and test it and try it. Um, but again, there's so many different ways to come to the final answer. It's, it really comes down to which one's right. Yeah, I was going to say, again, to piggyback on what Aaron said, I think the one key point here is that most of our, uh, our technicians are very experienced that we have working here. Either they've worked on racing teams in the past or have been here for a long time supporting the various series. So it's one of those things that comes down to the, the support part of the S, uh, the three S's, um, is really having that background and that experience to look at that situation. And, and as Aaron mentioned, you know, know whether to go for the bar for the spring or to make a shock adjustment. I think, you know, we have a, uh, I think our technicians are, are the best in the world in terms of that and that cumulative experience they have for all forms of racing. Can you talk a little bit more about rebound? I mean, I know you've uh, you know mentioned it, but you know, depending on you know whether you want the car to come up or or whether you're trying to keep the tires on the ground or whatever it is, but how that adjustment really has a huge impact on what you're doing and either trying to hook up or just you know keep the car moving through the corner as it should. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, rebound is a very powerful adjustment, um, and and it, it is for as some of the, the things we talked about the understeer and the oversteer. And just the weight transfer of the car is a very powerful adjustment. Um, so again, depending on if you're using bleed or a high speed rebound adjustment, you can really change the attitude of the car under the brakes, uh, on the power, uh, and to address understeer. You know, if you're trying to pin the nose or if you're trying to let the nose come up, it's a very powerful adjustment, and it's probably, um, I'd say, one of the most sensitive adjustments on the car for the driver feel part of it for sure. Yeah, and. And really, where does that, I mean, you know, that comes into play uh, in a lot of different parts of what the car is doing. You mentioned under power, under braking, going through the corners and all of that. You know, is there one of those or does it depend on what type of racing you're doing that, hey, you really need to first optimize it here and then branch off from there? How does that work? Yeah, again, I think so much of it goes to driver feel. Um, if you take certain types of racing, for instance, like NASCAR, um, I'd say early 2000s, zero point, uh, the term zero point be 
became very popular. And what that was referring to is really just how strong the rebound was in the shock. And I would just, what they were really trying to do is just hold the car at a certain attitude. So the car became more aero efficient because when the car is more aero efficient, you're going to have better grip. Um, so really they started using shocks as just trying to tie the car down. And that was all done with rebound. Um, so again, it really goes to the type of racing that you're doing because not always the most aero efficient car is going to be the best. If you get to a really, really rough racetrack and you try to tie that car down, you're essentially eliminating the suspension from moving. And if you get to a rough racetrack, obviously that's not going to be the best way to handle and get around. Um, so it, it's really, it really comes down to, again, the overall package, but the driver feel, how comfortable the driver is going to be, um, the track surface itself, how rough it is versus how smooth it is. If it's a, if it's a really, really smooth racetrack, you can really tie that down and not really have to worry about the suspension working too much. Uh, but then again, as it starts to roughen up, it's going to start to, the sidewall of the tire is going to try to work and become part of the suspension. So you don't want to hurt your tires that way. So then you need your suspension to move. So you loosen the rebound up a little bit, get it to start moving. Um, but again, it, it's, it's a hard, um, it's a, re it's a really a hard question to answer because um, it's all so, there's so many variables that come into play. Um, like, Typically, like, uh, for instance, like high rebound typically will heat your tires up quicker. Um, so say for qualifying, if, if you have a, if you've got to get heat the tires quicker because you're only doing one or two laps, um, you'll run a more aggressive setup for qualifying than what you would uh, then say for a 30 lap event or something like that. So again, there's just a lot of variables and it's understanding and just talking to the industry experts and understanding what works best for your application, whether it be because of a racetrack or how you're driving or even how the tires move. What about bump stops? You know, we always hear a lot about that. Um, can you really, for someone who might just totally be a layman on this, exactly what they are, what they do and how they benefit? Yeah, so simply a bump stop is, it, it's really a position sensitive device that's gonna help add load at a certain position. Um, so as the shock's traveling and the suspension's traveling through its travel, um, you might want at the bottom of its travel or the max point where you want the vehicle to stop traveling, instead of just hitting a solid stop, you're going to want it to hit an increase in spring rate. So the easiest way to do that is to put a bump stop in there. And there's a ton of different bump stops out there, different shapes, different materials. Uh, there's rubber, there's foam. Uh, there's deflective disc, there's all kinds of things that you can put on the shock itself to create a, uh, an increase in load. Um, and really that's what you're trying to do. If you look at say Daytona, the 24 hours of Daytona, for example, that's a great application where almost everybody runs bump stops because half the racetrack you're running on, on the oval where it's, it's fast, you got high banking, so you're seeing a high load. But then when you get down to the infield, it's very flat. So you need the vehicle to be able to move around a lot. Um, so you're running at two different ride heights completely. Uh, typically on the infield, you're gonna have a more compliant, softer suspension. So you, you have better mechanical grip, but that same suspension on the banking when they're doing close to 200 miles an hour, you have a lot of aero pushing on the car, you're gonna be at the max travel of the suspension. Um, and then if you throw any bumps in there, they're going to bottom out the suspension. So that's where they go and they'll put a bump rubber in there. So they're only really seeing it on the oval portion where the suspension is at its max travel. But then when they get to the road course portion, they can be back on the softer setup and have better mechanical grip. Um, so really it's just, it's just an added tuning tool that helps in either spring rate, your shock settings, things like that. And, and one thing I'll throw in there too, that sometimes those bump stops and depending if it's a rubber or a Belleville stack or something, you can get spring rate Effects that you can't get with a standard coil spring. You get that real pro progressive shape. Um, that, that standard linear spring is just a, a linear curve. But if you want it to then go progressive for certain things, um, that's how you, you can utilize those devices for that sort of uh, behavior as well. Oh, wow. Uh, that is pretty interesting. You know, when we look at even what you have there on the table and behind you, uh, different types of shocks and different ways of making adjustment, whether you have like an external reservoir or something like that, can you talk about some of the differences in the shocks? Yeah, yeah. So some of the, some of the examples we have here, um, like back here on the shock dyno, we have a, uh, a four-way adjustable. This is off a GT3 sports car. Um, so that's a four-way adjustable. It's a, it's a through-rod shock. Uh, so there's 
different types of shocks, for instance, you have a monotube shock, uh, you, have, you have a twin tube style shock, you have through ride style shocks, um, there's even rotary and different types of things like that. Essentially, they're all doing the same thing. They, most of them have some sort of piston or deflective shim in there that actually will adjust the damping. Um, and each application is different. It, it all depends on either what the engineer is looking for, uh, what will actually fit on the vehicle. Um, a lot of what we do and specialize in is just getting shocks to fit on certain applications. Uh, race cars these days are becoming so, again, aero dependent, um, or they're just where you're putting the shock is so tight. Um, we have some applications where they're actually inside of gearboxes and things like that. Um, so just how you're designing the shock from the start really depends on the application that it's going on. Um, but our, I would take, for for example, like a NASCAR team, they're running a just a monotube shock. It's gas pressurized, has a separator piston um, to separate your, your nitrogen from your oil. Um, then they have a main piston like one of these here with some deflective shims on either side of it. And that's what produces their damping. Um, and then you go to... Uh, and the rules dictate, NASCAR dictates, you can only have a single adjustment on those shocks. Um, then we go to say like a dirt late model and they're running a two or three way adjustable remote shock. So that means the canister is hanging off the side of the shock. They'll have a separate compression adjuster as well as a rebound adjuster on the shaft. Um, and again, that's something the sanctioning body dictates and allows us to run in those series. Um, what's, what's great about our, our shocks, I believe is we use the same pistons in a lot of our different shock absorbers. So whether it's a dirt track, a sprint car, a snowmobile, whatever it might be, we use the same type of piston and shim stack in a lot of them. So we can transfer technology and transfer setup very easily. Uh, and that's and that's, that can be a really big advantage. And in the end, I, like I said before, in the end, I think regardless of what you're racing, everybody's trying to get more grip. Um, that's the big thing is a hey, more grip is gonna make us faster. So. If we learn something over in, in uh, say, IndyCar, we can transfer that over to our late models. And again, everybody's trying to do the same thing, just find more grip. We're just maybe on a different surface or running a different tire, uh, but we can learn from that. So. Yeah, it's pretty amazing the different ways you can sort of, if you will, skin the cat in something like this, the way you can do things. Uh, if you do have a question, feel free to type it into the chat. I know we've got a couple of them in there right now, and we'll certainly get to those here momentarily. But any questions that you might have for Jim or Aaron, just type it into the chat, and we would be more than happy to talk about them. But before we do that, um, I do want to cover a, a couple more topics. I mean, we've talked about road course racing. We've talked about oval track racing. You mentioned NASCAR, dirt late models, and all of that. But drag racing, you know, I mean, drag racers are always trying to find a way to hook up and make things happen. And I don't necessarily know how often people think about really where a shot could come into play and be a huge benefit to them. Yeah, drag racing is, is a really big market for us. Uh, just this past weekend, we were at Maple Grove with the no prep street outlaw guys. Um, and now you're getting, so now you're getting different variations of drag racing even. So uh, you take NHRA, PDRA, those type of events, they're going on a prep surface, which means they're spraying the surface um, it's, as, it's as sticky as it's going to get. You have the temperature and the weather and those types of variables, but the track surface is prepared. I mean, it, it's, it's good to go. Um, now we have this whole other set of variables where these no prep guys and the racing is getting very popular. They're coming with two, 3,000 horsepower cars and they're running on a non prep racetrack. Um, it's definitely a new variable. It kind of definitely levels the playing field out, but it makes you set your suspension up different because they're doing different things with power. You have turbo cars, superchargers, nitrous cars. They're all applying power differently, which means your suspensions all have to be set up differently. So drag racing itself, it's, it's always been all about the motor and definitely more horsepower helps. Uh, but they, in a class like no prep, um, it, it's, it's really, it's really how you put that power to the ground. And there's a lot of cars out there that do very well that have a lot less horsepower than, than some others, but they're just more efficient with it and they're getting it to the ground. Um, there's classes that make you run a smaller tire. You're not allowed to run a real big, a real big tire and, and tub the car and things like that. So again, the size of the tire that you're using and the type of the tire that you're using, it'll determine how you set your suspension up, how aggressive you hit that that tire and get up on it and get going. Uh, there's drag racing, there's as many variables as there is in any other form of racing. And I think a lot of guys, um, 
where the perception is, hey, they're just going in a straight line, it's easy to do. Um, there's there's a ton of variables in how they set those cars up and what they're doing, what's in their share. Yeah, does it make a, a huge difference in, you know, let's say you're running in a class that you have a tire that, that you know, that grows, um, or you're running in a class that maybe the front end actually does stay on the ground a little bit more and doesn't come off or is not as light. I mean, you know, how much does even front suspension come into play in certain classes? Yeah, front end suspension is 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 huge. Uh, pro stock, pro mod, top sportsman, those type, um, the front dropout on a car, and how quickly it drops out or how slowly it drops out has a huge effect on it. Um, you can imagine if the front end is not controlled very well, when you hit that throttle and you have a ton of horsepower going to the rear, if you have that front end real loose, it's just going to throw everything back and you're going to get that big wheel stand. And you don't always want that. Um, most of the time you want to have that front end be very controlled, come up a certain distance and then drop out and come down a certain distance. And that's usually the fastest way down the track. Uh, so tuning the front suspension is just as important as the rear. Um, they're, they're communicating with each other. What spring rate you're running on the front versus what you're running on the back. Um, it's one big timing device. And that's one thing I think that's common between all these, all these types of racing is the shocks, the springs, the suspension itself is really just a big timing device. You're trying to get it all to work together at a certain time when you're in a corner or when you're launching in a drag application. If you can get them all timed right, you're going to do better. But again, it's, it's like you said, the front end is just as important as the rear. Uh, we just had a customer in here yesterday, one of the street outlaw guys, and we fixed him up a brand new front suspension because uh, what he had on there just wasn't working. It wasn't controlling anything. And I know uh, it was um, Dominator. He's super excited to get to the next event, Darlington, because this is the first time he's like, I'm going to have a front suspension that's working and I can actually tune around. Uh, so it'll be exciting to see how, how, uh, how those guys do for sure. You have the shock dyno uh, behind you that you pointed to. Um, you know, I, for a lot of people, they know it, they see it. I don't know that uh, as many people really understand it. And I'm sure a lot of people would love to have an understanding of how that would help them and how that would benefit them. So when it comes to, you know, uh, a shock dyno graph and what it shows and what can be learned by it, what do we need to know? Uh, there's, I guess there's a couple different ways to, to look at it. The, the first thing I try to tell anybody, regardless of the brand of shock you're running, Make sure you get a dyno graph. Um, you'd be surprised at how many racers are out there that are trying to adjust or tune their suspension. And the first question we ask them is, do you have a dyno graph? And they're like, nope. And to, really what you're doing there is you're just throwing a dart at a very, very small dartboard. Uh, because the, the shock itself, you need to have a dyno graph to tell you what's in what, what your shot's actually doing. Um, so the machine itself, it's pretty simple. It's just Travel, it's moving at a certain speed and it's telling you what your shock is producing force wise at that speed. Um, it's not going to tell you what it's going to do on the car or anything like that, but it's a way to relay if you get data from the car or at least from a driver's standpoint to understand, okay, if my shock is moving this fast on the dyno and I see that similar speed velocity wise, if my suspension is moving that fast on the track, I know it's producing this amount of force. And what's even bigger then is when you make an adjustment to know how, how stiff or how soft that adjustment was and what did that do to either the driver feel, the tire wear, um, the suspension travel. That's when you can start to apply what you see on the shock dyno to what you see on the race track and what the driver is ultimately feeling. And it's really pairing all that together. Uh, but to start, you have to have a dyno graph. There's, other than that, you're really just guessing. Yeah, the, the, and the other thing um, that we've always heard is that just by putting the Penske's on a lot of times, just the consistent consistency you get from well-matched shock absorbers, just even if they're not optimized for the setup, just the fact that they're matched well is so important for consistency on the track and repeatability. So you start there and make sure from your supplier, whoever you're using, they're sending you a graph showing that the, that the, the shocks are matched and, and tuned properly, and then you can build from there. Yeah. And, you know, when it comes to that, as far as buying shocks, do I get dyno sheets with them? Can I call you and say, hey, here's what I'm looking for? You know, can you dyno a shock and maybe at least set it kind of in the range of what I'm looking for? What do I get? Yeah. So from our side, every shock that we build, every shock we build here at Penske is hand built. Uh, we manufacture the majority of our pieces, but every shock that goes out the door is dyno documented, the data saved. We have data back from the mid 90s for customers that 
you never know when they're going to call up or if that car gets sold and it's passed around to a bunch of different racers. Uh, but we have a lot of data going years back that we always bring up. But every shock is dynoed. Um, we send an explanation sheet of, okay, this is this kind of entry level of how you read a dyno sheet and what it means. Um, one big misconception is a lot of people refer to low speed or high speed uh, damping. They think it's just how fast the, the vehicle is traveling. And it's really not. It's just, it's, it's really how quickly your suspension is moving up and down. Um, so it's not so much the vehicle speed that, that we're talking about there. Um, but yeah, that, that's really, when you get a shock from us, and I, I tell any, any consumer, even if you're not running our shocks, uh, we'll do a lot of comparisons. If somebody has a question and they're running a different brand, we'll tell them, hey, if you don't have Dynograph, send them in, we'll dyno them for you. So you at least see what you have. And then we're starting from baseline and go from there. Um, but yeah, anybody out there listening, Make sure, make sure your shock guy, your tuner, whoever it might be, is going to give you a shock guy. Yeah, then no, obviously very important. A um, couple of questions from the chat, if if you guys don't mind. Um, uh, first one says, how much does sway bar affect suspension setup? Um, sway bar, sway bar plays a very big role. Um, so sway bar, obviously, um, a lot of times when we start tuning a car, if we're tuning with somebody from, uh, say, from scratch. We like to try to get the sway bar out of the equation because the sway bar can mask, obviously, what either the driver's feeling or what the suspension is going to do. And what we like to do is try to optimize the shock and spring package by itself. If we can optimize that package and then use the sway bar as an added tuning tool, that's the best way to go. Um, we've seen a lot of times where somebody has a very, very stiff bar on the car and you can make shock adjustments, even spring changes. And the driver just comes back and I didn't feel a difference. I mean, a lot of time that's because the sway bar um, or the bar itself is just masking what, what changes you're doing there. It's, it's more powerful than anything you're doing to the suspension. Um, very similar is a very stiff bump stop. There are some setups that guys just like to drop the car down on the bump stop. And I think a lot of it is the old, um, the old misconception of, hey, a very stiff, stable platform is a great handling car. Um, which might be true on a, a very flat, smooth surface, but then when you start hitting bumps and get to a rougher racetrack, obviously that really stiff suspension doesn't handle those bumps as well. Um, so again, sway bars are great. It's just another added adjustment. But when we're tuning, um, if you're trying to optimize your shock and spring package, we recommend going with a softer bar or even disconnecting the bar and optimize the, the, the shocks and springs themselves first. Oh, wow. That's interesting. All right. This is a bit of a longer question here. It says, uh, can your guests speak a bit of how a pro team gathers information from the driver or drivers? My experience is that teams like Pratt Miller ask the drivers to break each turn into five segments. I know we were talking about three earlier. Uh, that information is then fed into a database from which the track engineers can offer suggestions on what setup changes would be beneficial. Basically, how best can a team communicate suspension characteristics to improve performance? That, that's a great question. And from the top down, from your Pratt Millers, obviously the yellow Corvettes, um, taking that down to a track day guy who has a Corvette that they're running. Um, obviously somebody like Pratt Miller that has a group of engineers working together on the suspension or has multiple cars, Having a database like that that they can have the drivers and NASCAR teams do it, Formula One teams do it. Um, it's all about how quickly that information can come from driver A, driver B, get to the engineers. However many engineers can look at that and then respond with, okay, here's the changes we would do, and you pick your best changes. Um, again, professional teams have the luxury of paying engineers and, and having multiple drivers do that. Um, but as far as the question is, five different segments in a corner, three different, whatever it is, it really comes down to how quickly you can look at that data, transmit it, and then make the change. Um, so from my, from our standpoint, um, again, we deal with the professional teams that do that, do it the same way, but we also deal with your grassroots guy that's driving the pickup truck with the car hooked up to the back that's going to go. So we like to try to make it simple and say, okay, focus on entry, focus on mid, focus on exit. Hopefully if they're, if they're running for, more than a year if they're if they're well experienced and they're 10 years into this they'll get more they'll get more experience with breaking corners down and they'll know okay my entry to mid 
that's really where my issue is in the middle. So then they're adding another segment to it from there. Um, but really the name of the game is data, collecting data, taking good notes. That's one of the biggest things. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of your um, Saturday night racer or your, um, your entry level guys, just, they really ignore the data side. They really ignore the note taking side. Um, I go in trailers and work with teams and they're pulling out old notebooks and you can barely read what they wrote. And it's like, well, they, it's unfortunate because they end up losing, they end up, they end up spending and wasting a lot of time and money redoing something that they did two years ago. So it's, it's really good. Yeah, you'll see, you'll see, as Aaron mentioned, the best, you know, the top tier teams are, you know, as soon as that car is out of the session, they're plugging in, they're downloading that data immediately. They're getting the drivers still in their driver's outfits right into the lounge. They're getting their comments right away. So it's still fresh so they can respond to that, uh, capture what they're thinking and make those changes really quickly. And that's how those best, those good teams, especially, um, you know, are, are at the top of their game. They can make those live changes really, really quickly. And real quick, one more note to that too. Different sanctioning bodies have different rules. Like somewhere that like Pratt Miller was mentioned, they're running in a series that they can run data on the car. So they're capturing, they have sensors on the car that are capturing every piece of information, whether it be from the shocks, the suspension travel, springs, driver wheel input, things like that. You get to a place like dirt late models or modifieds or um, some of these other series where you're not al allowed to run data. So you're really going off of the driver input. Um, and again, drivers are humans. They're gonna make errors. And sometimes you don't always get the correct information back from the driver. So that's where making notes, even if you make a change and it's bad, having that note to say, hey, this change did this and it wasn't good, knowing and then trying to figure out why it wasn't good. Uh, again, data is a great thing because it kind of, it'll pair with what the driver's saying to what you're physically seeing on the car. But there's so many cases where you're not allowed to run data or it's just not cost, uh, cost effective to run data. Uh, so that's where you're really relying on the human element. And when you're relying on the human element, tire wear, tire heat, driver input, all of that is so much more important because that's all you have to go off of. That is your data. Um, so it's really important to check all those boxes and have and really have a setup sheet. And that's one of the simple things you can do is just have a proper setup sheet or checklist to say, okay, I got every, I got every piece of information the same way each time uh, because we all know how it is at the racetrack. You're in a thrash, something happens to the car, you're going to forget something. So having checklists and, and notes is, is very important. You know, we have uh, driving styles that are different too, you know, and it depends on if you're on an oval road course, whatever you might be doing, you know, maybe you have a driver mm -hmm. on ovals that prefer, prefers a loose race car. We talked about, uh, you know, oversteer versus understeer. Maybe you have some drivers in road racing that have a tendency to attack the corners or might want to have a shallow entry or exit, whatever it might be. You know, how different now do my shock settings and suspension settings become based on the feel that my driver is looking for? Yeah, they're, they're very, very different. Um, we have the luxury of working with some of the best teams in the world. And we can tell you for sure, drivers, whether it's two, three, four car teams, all drivers have their own little preferences. And the majority of the time, they're running a different setup. Um, the only time you really see the same setup is if one driver is really struggling and another driver is really fast. The struggling driver will say, okay, let give me his setup and I'll try to drive it the way he is because he's at least showing that he's fast with it. So they got to learn to drive it that way. Um, but there's so many, so many little differences. And I, I always tell the guys I work with, I'm not a driver. I wish I was, I wish I could feel that little difference that they're talking about, but, but I'm not, but there, there's definitely something there. Um, we see it every year when we go to Indy, um, you go to Indianapolis and these Indy cars, they're, they're all so fast. They're all trimmed out. Some drivers love a loose feeling car or a car that oversteers. And then you get other drivers that if that, if that car oversteers even the slightest bit, they're out of the throttle. They want that car to be tight or understeer. Um, and they're both fast. I mean, you can look at drivers that set them up two different ways and they're both fast. It really, come, it really just comes down to making them comfortable. Um, but again, even, even these super teams, the Hendricks, the Penske's that have multiple drivers, talented drivers, the best in the world, all these drivers have little different little differences that they want to feel different, and it's, it's either going to make them faster or slower. So. Yeah, there's a story that I heard um, about 
Michael Schumacher, and, and he was, they would do all this simulation and, and all that to tell them what the car, the optimum setup for the car, which was undrivable by a lot of people because the car moved around a lot. And there's this footage I remember seeing from Hockenheim and the chicane, and the car was softly set up. So he had to discipline himself to turn into the corner a few seconds before he normally would to let the car move over and grip up. But it was very unsettling for a lot of people to drive something like that with that that movement in the car. But he was able to do that. And, and that, again, that's that's optimizing the setup around the simulation and what the car needs and then the driver adapting to it. Um, and, and some of the really good drivers are able to do that. Um, so, it, and his, again, his setup is vastly different than, than his uh, teammate. So, you know, again, it just shows you there's vastly different setups for different drivers that they can optimize and hang on the driver. You know, it's interesting. You talk about what the car needs and what the driver needs. Is there a tipping point where, you know, maybe you have to say, hey, no, we need to work on what the car needs uh, versus, uh, okay, we'll, we'll sort of adapt to you and what you want. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there definitely is there, and that, and that's the. I, I always err on the side of the driver. I always like because in the end, it's it's the driver behind the wheel. They got to be comfortable, even if they're slow, if they're comfortable. The driver. It's rare to find a driver that raises hand and say, "Hey, it's me. I'm the slow one." It's usually it's usually always something else. But I always like to err on the side of hey, let's make him comfortable first. And then from an engineering side or a setup side, then we can focus on getting better tire wear, getting faster. But the driver's got to be comfortable first. Um, so I always lean more towards that side and then bring in the setup side and everything after that. Uh, but again, it, it's it's tough because I say drivers are humans. I mean, they have bad days like we do. They wake up and they're grumpy. I mean, sometimes you're just not going to make a driver happy. And at that point, it's like, okay, let's try to just get the best optimized setup, whether it be for tire wear, for pit stop strategy, whatever it might be, there's other ways to set up a car. Um, but I always, I always err to the side of, hey, if you make the driver happy, it's gonna be a, a better day for everybody. Yeah, and I think, I think Aaron and I have been to enough seven post shaker tests to know, you know, the, the outputs, the optimal setup is this extremely soft setup. And we just know there's no way the driver is going to like that, but it looks great on all the, the heave and pitch and contact patch and everybody's giving each other high fives. But once it gets to the racetrack, then reality sets in. And what Aaron said, you've got to, you have to tune that to the driver so he can actually, or he or she can drive it. All right. Another question from the chat. Uh, when is a linear uh, slash digressive piston preferred over a high flow linear piston, piston in stock car and road racing applications? So that's a good, that's a great question. I mean, a high flow obviously is just going to flow more fluid through it. Um, typically, it's a more compliant feel, um, and depending on how you valve it, um, it's not going to control the chassis. It's not going to give you the best balance. It's obvious. It's going to let the suspension move around a little more, which, depending on the driver feel, can be better. Um, the the digressive style piston that was developed to give you. Um, a more stable go-kart like feel. Um, and again, there's some drivers, depending on the, dis the discipline they came from, um, if you look at NASCAR back in the day, a lot of oval racing, a lot of dirt racing, a lot of places where the cars just moved around more because of the type of racing. Then you go and look at IndyCar or sports car type racers, they come from a go-kart background with no suspension whatsoever. So they're used to that real stiff feel. So the, digress the digressive piston is really it's really come around to say, okay, you can run this style piston. It's going to be very stiff, very firm. You can typically run a softer spring rate, which could lead to more mechanical grip. Um, but I would say 75% of the time, if you can get a driver to, to like the high flow or a linear style piston, again, the chassis is harder to control. So you got to do some things different, whether it be with bar or spring. But generally, a high flow and linear type piston is going to give you better mechanical grip. And if you have a driver that can learn to drive that, it's that's just one more advantage they have over the guy that is driving a digressive style or really stiff style setup. Ah, that's a great, exp <clears throat> great explanation. Um, let's see. Uh, and then another question here, explain base valves and when they should be used. Jim? Um, yeah, I mean, the base valve was developed to really, when we were getting into our pressure balancing uh, uh, Topic called pressure balancing, where you're trying to optimize the pressures in the in the damper through its compression and rebound stroke. 
Um, and there's always a balance between uh, friction levels in the shock, uh, gas pressure, and your compression forces. And you really want to have a pretty small, in an ideal world, you want to have a small percentage from that base valve, just so you could run minimum gas pressure and still not cavitate. Um, and, but you don't want your base valve to overpower the whole shock. You know, you want most of your damping to be done on the main piston. Uh, that's the best responding place to have your damping. So we like to say the base valve should be in the seven to 10% of the overall damping force that's created from that. You don't want it too soft or too, or, or too stiff. If you go below that threshold, you have to add more gas pressure to keep it from cavitating. And that ends up, you know, more seal drag, more rod force. If you go way over that, then it ends up being a hysteresis monster because now you're, you're, you're pumping the fluid through the head valve and that's creating your damping versus at the main piston where it's reacting. So, um, you know, different areas, we run base valves in everywhere from uh, Indy cars to, uh, to dirt track to uh, sprint cars, you know, you name it, uh, Formula One. Uh, Formula One, for sure, we're running base valves there too. And again, you're really just always trying to optimize um, that that sort of balance uh, of pressures in the shock and have a uh, low hysteresis, uh, best performing um, shock package for any any damping purpose. Yeah, real quick, added to that base valve, oval track is very very popular. NASCAR, that's where I think most base valve terminology came from back in the '90s. We started adding base valves to it. Um, one misconception is. Uh, we get a lot of a lot of I would say grassroots racers, oval type racers. Hey, I need a base valve. It's got to be better. Um, it's really just a second piston above your main piston. It's a fixed piston that's creating more pressure above it, um, and it's all relative to the amount of compression damping you're producing. We have I, the biggest misconception is you have to run a base valve if you're only producing 50 pounds of load at a 10 inch per second spike. You don't even need a base valve because you're not gaining anything from it. You don't need a lot of gas pressure to avoid cavitation when you produce that low load. Um, so that's where I, I would caution anybody. Base valves are great. They can definitely be an advantage. But sometimes base valves are just overused because NASCAR, a lot of NASCAR teams run base valves. So then, of course, anybody running a dirt track is like, well, I got to run a base valve if, if NASCAR is running them. And that's just not the way. It's, it, that's a great example of if you understand and learn how the shock's working, um, an added piece can actually hurt you. If I'm running a series where I'm going to the same track every week and I'm just optimizing my car, I mean, is it okay for me just to have one set of shocks that maybe I can adjust? Or at what point does it become, maybe I'm running three different tracks or three different lengths or, you know, different, you know, uh, uh, surfaces, whatever it might be. At what point do I need to start looking at, okay, it makes more sense for me to have shocks for this track and this track, as opposed to trying to adjust the only ones that I have? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And we see that a lot. And that's where um, I try to tell our teams, like, hey, you're running your team almost as a business. You want your business to succeed. If you're running one or two racetracks, you focus and optimize only on those track conditions, whatever the tires might be. Um, I don't want to say, well, it is. It, it's a lot easier. If you're just running one or two racetracks, it's a lot easier to optimize for the driver field, the racetrack, the tires you're running, and, and focus on that. Where I think a lot of I give a lot of respect to travel and tour racers, whether it be sports car, NASCAR, dirt late model, whatever it might be, because they're, they're traveling all across the country. They're seeing different services, different, different atmosphere, different temperatures, different dirt. Uh, there's so many variables. And the ones that are successful across the country, they're doing a lot of homework. There's so many variables that they're adjusting for. It, it's, it's really difficult. I mean, it, it's a very difficult thing. Um, and I don't think a lot of the, the national touring guys get enough credit. And you'll see when, like sprint cars here in Pennsylvania is huge, when the World of Outlaws or some of these other series come and they're running against the PA Posse guys, these Pennsylvania guys are really good around this area because they race here all the time. Um, it's a different story if you go out to the West Coast or go down South or even the Midwest, you just have different dirt conditions and it's very hard to get a hold of that. So. Uh, that's one thing. Testing is so important, and I'm sure drivers and teams would love to test every day of the week if they could. It just gets expensive to do. Um, but to your point, if you if you run only certain tracks, it, it definitely is easier for us to help you set up just for that condition. But then also, no, you might take that to another racetrack, and it's not as good. So there's a variable there you got you got to play with. And I know it probably depends on what you're running. You know how how the length of races and different things like that, but. 
at, at what point is it recommended that I need to rebuild my shock or I need to change seal, do all those different things? Yeah, another great question. So for us, I, I, I always try to tell our teams is it's no different. The oil is the big question. And I, I always tell them, hey, how often do you change your race engine oil? Because the shock oil is really the same thing. Um, but bigger, bigger to that is a lot of these, a lot of these racers don't realize they're putting more miles on their shocks when the car is in the trailer than what they're actually doing on the racetrack. So the first thing I tell them is, hey, make sure you have a set of tow shocks because a set of tow shocks is going to make your race shocks last a lot longer. Um, if we got guys that are towing a few hundred miles, again, they put more miles on those shocks in the trailer than they did out on the racetrack. So you're going to have to replace your oil and shim sooner. Um, most most customers can get away with the service every three to six months, depending how much they're racing. Uh, but then I take an example, our, our NASCAR guys, our IndyCar guys, our sports car guys that are running Daytona and things like that, they're constantly servicing and revalving their shocks, so they're always getting fresh oil. Um, but a good rule of thumb is every three to six months, at least change your oil, and that's going to keep all your parts working properly. Um, it's going to save you money down the road, for sure. Would have never even thought about the trailering part of that that you just brought up. I'm wondering how many light bulbs just went <laughs> off for a lot of people. Um, a question here from the chat. Is there an advantage to running remote reservoirs versus a shock with a reservoir built into the top of the shock? And I know you mentioned also sometimes this could also be series specific too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So obviously if you have a remote adjuster, uh, your fluid path for your, for your oil to flow to compression, it, it's obviously a little bit further. Now, there are always circumstances. I mean, we, we usually say, hey, if the hose is within 12 to 24 inches, um, it's not that you're not going to feel a difference, but it really depends on how efficient your suspension is set up. Again, bars, springs, there's a lot of things that band-aid what you're going to feel out of the shock. So you might not even feel the difference between a monotube inline shock and a remote shock. But we do get the extreme cases. Um, not so much spec racer Ford, but Formula Fords and things like that. We'll have guys call up and like, hey, we want a six foot hose to connect the canister to the cockpit. And it's like, you can do that, but now you are starting to get into a length of a hose and the diameter of the hose, and you're gonna get dampened through that. So there you're starting to hurt the, uh, the, uh, the actual damping characteristic. But again, if you can adjust your shock from the cockpit, maybe that's a bigger advantage than what you're gonna lose from the damping side. Uh, but most of the time, we've done a lot of back-to-back -back testing with some really good drivers. From an engineering standpoint, I think um, you, you want to have the least amount of pieces in your shock absorber as you can. So if you can run a non-adjustable with a single piston and produce a certain damping force, that's probably the most efficient. But on the flip side of that, now to adjust that, you're going to take it off the car, revalve it. You waste a lot of time doing that. So there's always a give and take with everything. Um, but a good rule of thumb is 12 to 24 inch on the hose and you'll be fine. Interesting. All right. One final question here from the chat. Uh, pretty open one. What's the most common misconception in the shock world? Um, I think the biggest one that we see is more adjusters or a more expensive shock is better. And, and that's really, that's really the biggest misconception. And, um, one example Dirt late models, um, we typically run a two or three way adjustable shock. And that's really because the majority of those teams have one, two, maybe three sets of shocks. So the adjustability has to be there. They're running different types of racetracks. The drivers want to feel different things. Um, taking it a step further, some of our tour guys that, that do it for a living, that have done it for a long time, they run a single adjustable shock at certain corners because they know the damping that they want. Um, they might have two or three of those options build up, but they know what they need and why. Um, it's a cheaper shock. So I think that's the biggest misconception is, hey, a, a more adjustable, more expensive shock has got to be better. Um, when it's just not the case. I mean, it really comes down to your application, what you're trying to do, how many different racetracks you're running, how often you're using them, um, and you go from there. But again, that's why we're there. That's why we're hopefully here to help customers call, teach them, not be so intimidated by, by what all these shocks can do. 
Yeah, well, Aaron, Jim, thank you so much. We know you have a great distributor network, but people can also go direct to you as well and find you through the EPAR trade page. And uh, we really appreciate this. It's just been a fascinating learning experience. Yeah, thanks for having us again. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed it and uh, looking forward. Hopefully, you get to see everybody at SEMA or PRI this year. Um, hopefully, we get back to normal and uh, get to see everybody face to face. It's always good. And uh, thanks again. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you very much. That was a very quick hour. <laughs> it's just like, I think we could have run for another one. But no, thank you so much. You did a brilliant job. As always, you have so much to share. So thank you. Uh, we pushed uh, Penske uh, Shocks products back on the homepage of the ePortrait platform. You can actually see that uh, Shock Dino right now. The webinar has been recorded. It will be posted later on today on the platform as well as on our YouTube channel. We will be back next week with Impact Racing, and we're going to be talking driver safety and more specifically, race train technology. Thank you very much, and uh, let's go racing. Thanks, Mercedes. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you, Brad. Right. Thank you, Jay. Registering on EPAR Trade is easy. Fill out your name, email, phone number, and create a secure password. Next, select your business type. Choose supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose racing business if you're looking to find new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose race team if you own or are a member of a professional racing team. Begin typing your company name. We most likely already have your company in our database, which you can select from the dropdown. Then, enter your job title. Choose Claim Company if you'll be editing your company profile. Other members of your company can choose Join Company if they'd like to use ePartrade as well. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Click Register Now and your registration will be submitted for approval. You'll need to confirm your email once it goes through. To keep our platform industry only, you'll be approved shortly after. If we require additional proof of business, we'll reach out. Welcome to ePartrade.